Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jennifer, for that uh, kind introduction. First of all, giving honor to, to God and to your pastor, Reverend Roster, to deacons, trustees, and missionaries, and, and all who are assembled here this morning. I'm extremely happy to be with you as you have taken time out to celebrate another Black History Month, a time when we examine more closely the history, the achievements, the contributions, the concerns, the problems, where we are today as a people, and overall, the good and the bad of black history and the black experience in this country. We know that black history is American history. Yeah. Unfortunately, when the history of this country was written, and as it, as it continues to be written, blacks have been and are excluded. So are women, Native Americans, and others, especially people of color. So it becomes necessary for us to weave and blend into the story wherever and whenever we can, the history of black folks. So there is Black History Month and Women's History Month and Native American History Month and other people of color and ethnic groups have established these days and weeks and months to concentrate on their history and continued contributions to the fabric of this nation and beyond. So we're grateful this morning for the fact that uh, Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, established what we know of as African American History Month today. Black and white folks uh, were excluded to the extent that he felt it necessary to start Negro History Day in 1926. And then from that, it grew into what we now call African American History Month. Dr. Wilson believed that if you educate young white children about the true history of blacks, they would grow up knowing truth. And hopefully, they would not act like their parents and grandparents regarding race. So Black History Day eventually became Black History Week, and beginning in 1977, the entire month of February, its vote is devoted to concentrating on black history. Not because February is the shortest month of the year, but because Dr. Wilson admired Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, who were both born in February. Had they been born in December, it would have been December. Last year, we marked the 400th anniversary of the black presence in what we now call the United States. It was in 1619 that 20 black men and women were brought to Jamestown, Virginia. It is believed that they were first used as indentured servants, but within 45 years, the colonists of Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, New York, and New Jersey had all legalized the enslavement of people of African descent. So for 400 years, black folks have endured. In the face of unspeakable horror, black folks are still standing. If our ancestors could somehow peer through the telescope of time, they would say, despite everything thrown your way, y'all still stand. Amen. 205 years of legalized slavery in this country. Husbands watching their wives being raped. Parents watching their children being sold into slavery. Legalized segregation. The lynching of thousands of black men and women the bombing of churches and homes, political disfranchisement, the grandfather clause, literacy tests, gerrymandering, intentionally placing drugs in the black community to kill the civil rights movement. Black on black crime. Far too many black folks are dying at the hands of other black folks. Amen. And so much more. And yet, 
still standing. Amen. In 1619, 20 black folks came to Jamestown, and from that 20, there are now more than 42 million black people in this country and still standing, and in most cases, standing tall. Amen. After everything they have thrown your way, still standing, the church is still standing. Amen. So many of our institutions and organizations are still standing. Sometimes our legs get weary, our hearts broken, our spirits broken, our resolve questionable. But by the grace of God, God's umbrella protection and the abilities that he has bestowed upon us continue to lead us on this journey. But we have a lot of work to do to ensure that our legs remain steady and our resolve unquestionable. We are still standing, but there is so much more work to be done. This year's theme for our National Black History Month celebration is African Americans and the vote. This year marks the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment that was ratified back in 1870 and the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Bill that was passed in 1965, the lifetime of many of us were alive when that bill was passed back in 1965. One avenue to achieving what we need, what we want, what we gotta have, what can improve our quality of living, and so much more is complete and unabbreviated access to the constitutional guarantee of voting. Something that continues to evade black folks almost exclusively through a century and a half of outright violence by the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of White Camellia, the Rifle Associations of South Carolina and Louisiana, gerrymandering the poll taxes and good moral character and literacy tests, and all of those things passed in the southern states have kept black folks from the polls. Just in 2016, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down North Carolina's voter ID law, saying that the legislation, quote, targeted African Americans <coughs> with almost surgical precision, unquote. That is, it was designed exclusively to discriminate designed specifically to reduce the black vote. All of this was part of legislation passed by the North Carolina General Assembly in 2013 with their super majorities in both houses to just wreak havoc and turn back the hands of time to a bygone era that resembled Alamance and Orange Counties in 1870 and 1871. If you don't know what it was like in 1870 and 1871, bring it back and we can have a discussion about how ugly it was for black folks in our mass in Orange Counties uh, in 1870 and 1871. The legislation in 2013, known as House Bill 589, not only required ID, but it eliminated same-day voter registration. Remember that? Reduced the number of early voting days and prohibited the counting of out-of-precinct ballots by election officials. In the same year, the United States Supreme Court invalidated a section of the Voting Rights Bill passed in 1965 requiring states to get approval from the Justice Department before passing election legislation. In December 2000. 19, just about 45 days ago, 45 days ago, the United States District Judge Loretta Biggs struck down a December 2018 North Carolina voter ID law. They couldn't get you in 2013. The court overruled it in 2016. They came back in 2018 with another law down in Raleigh. But in her 60-page decision, she blocked the law saying she found compelling evidence that state Republican, Republican legislators acted with racially 
discriminatory intent. It means that voters will not have to present photo ID when they cast their ballots during the March 3rd primary elections. And so the beat goes on. Amen. The beat goes on. Amen. The beat goes on. It must be something about the power of a ballot. When we look back and peer through the telescope of time over the past 150 years and look at how many people have bled and died throughout this country to just go register to vote Amen. should tell us something about the power of the ballot. Mm -hmm. The massacre of 150 black people in Colfax, Louisiana in 1873 over political divisions. Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 resulting in the slaughter of dozens of blacks, possibly hundreds. The Atlanta race riot of 1906 resulted in the death of dozens of blacks. The fear of the black vote in Elaine, Arkansas in September 1919. Legal disfranchisement has stripped the black community of the vote. Coupled with post-World War anxiety and an ethos of hate and racism, hundreds of blacks were killed in late September and early October 1919. Just a few months ago, a memorial to those who were killed in the Elaine, uh, Elaine Massacre of 1919 was recently erected. And there's Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. The entire black community was nearly destroyed. Rosewood, Florida in 1923. But not only did massacres occur in the South, but during what has been called the Red Summer of 1919, <coughs> race riots occurred in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Syracuse, New York, and the biggest one where 43 people died in Chicago, Illinois. And though the ballot may not have been the precipitant cause of this violence, in nearly every case, it was an underlying cause. When I think about the future <coughs> of black history, the lives of black folks in, in the year 2030, 10 years from now, in 2040, in 2060, I often wonder what it might look like for us in 30 years. In addition to fighting the powers that stand in the way of voting and registering to vote and then voting and carrying someone to vote, we can add years to our life and enjoy a better quality of life. This might take you back just a little bit and wonder why we, I'm talking about this. But we can add a little bit of quality to our lives by eating just a little better than we do. We need to take care of our bodies if we plan to be around. This is our temple. Oh, that bacon, and that sausage, and that fat back, some of that other stuff that are clogging our arteries on a daily basis is good, but it's absolutely killing us if we consume too much of it in moderation. We have high rates of heart attacks and diabetes strokes, arthritis, complications, and eventually death. And if we, gotta, if we don't exercise and watch our intake, our future will surely be a wee bit short. Let food be thy medicine. And we need to work hard to ensure that we elect people who will not destroy Medicare. Amen and Medicaid yeah. and other programs that these issues surround. In 2017, black Americans had a total income of nearly $800 billion. That is an income greater than most nations around the world. It's more money than any African nation on the continent of Africa. Hopefully one day we will somehow pool some of these 
resources like other folks have done to support our community. Amen. If we decide that we're going to pool our resources, schools, daycare facilities, and grocery stores, credit unions, and social welfare programs could be established. Too often we somehow believe that you have to go out there to celebrate achievement, contributions, and accomplishments. But one only has to look around you to see that there is much to celebrate. And there are those we must recognize in our own midst who are pioneers in their own right. All history is local. No one's history is as important as your own. Rather than writing a biography of someone, write your own story. Write your autobiography. It is not self-serving. It is not egotistical to say I'm going to write about myself. Because when you write about yourself, you're writing about everything that goes on around you. And then after you write your own, <coughs> writing grandmamas and granddaddies will be a bit easier. All of us should be armed with a video camera and a notepad interviewing members of our families and our communities. The best history, the very best <coughs> history is lying out there in the graveyard. So many members of our community, because we do not think it important to celebrate our own, departed this life without giving us their story. Everyone has a story. A life itself is a story. With that video camera and notepad, interview your parents, grandparents, and other members of your family. Collect their important stories so that when it's time to celebrate, you will have a body of collected evidence to pass on to succeeding generations. Far too many people are marrying each other because they did not know that they were cousins. <laughs> this is a good reason to conduct genealogical studies, to see who your folks are. Go to family union and say, oh my God, I didn't know that we were cousins. You remember when we dated just a few? <laughs> many of the keys to unlock the doors to solving many of the problems that we face can be best achieved with us helping ourselves. And I'm not talking about the need for millions of dollars either. That would be nice. But we can play a small part in trying to steer young folks male and female and, and all races and ethnic groups in the right direction in a number of ways. You start a study group concentrating on your energies on young people who are less fortunate than we are. It may not be easy, but if a few can be saved, it's worth it. Amen. What about big sister and big brother programs where we mentor and guide young folk? We need more role models in the black community. We need more than a sports hero. Our children must look at teachers and ministers and carpenters and brick masons and plumbers and landscapers and homemakers as heroes and heroines. And we need more of this if we are to save these young people who have the potential to be chemists, teachers, astronauts, and lawyers, and politicians and drug counselors. Let's not lose a generation of young people who could, as Dr. King said, hew out of the mountain a stone of hope. A group of people who could be able to transform the jangling discourse into a symphony of brotherhood. A generation of black men and women who could help ensure that the life expectancy would increase rather than <coughs> decrease as it has over the past few years. We need young people who will go to school and be educated to help lower the infant mortality rate from 14 deaths per 1,000 in the black community to something much less. We need folks who will go out there and help us lower the poverty rates. We need people who will go out there and ensure that all of these things are achieved to helping us fulfill the dream that all people, regardless of race, 
or ethnicity would enjoy the fruits of the promissory note that was signed by the founding fathers when they wrote the words of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. And so we must rededicate ourselves to these and other causes that will help us perpetuate the survival of us. Again, if our ancestors could somehow peer through the telescope of time, they would be proud to see that their children, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren have made incredible progress over the decades. They would say that some progress, but are still a long way to go. In 1968, only 26% of blacks 25 years of age and older had finished high school, 26%. Now, in 2019, as of 2019, 87% of blacks 25 and older have a high school degree. It is a myth that there are more black men in prison than in college. Actually, there are twice as many black males in college than in prison and in jail. All right. But that 6% of the black population of men in jail, that black male population is still too far. It's far, uh, still too many of them in prison. The number of black college students has risen considerably uh, throughout the last 40 years. 2.5 million blacks are in college as of 2017 but the graduation rates are still pitiful. You get there, but for some reason, a lot of reasons when I graduated. Black income, when adjusted for inflation, has not changed very much since the year 2000. The median annual income for black families is $20,000 less than the national median annual income. Black folks make 82 cents for every dollar that whites make in this country. 40% of black Americans uh, own homes in the United States today. But that's no real change since 1968. So as I come to a close, let me stress the importance of us as black people releasing ourselves from some of the chains that have held us bound regarding the way we treat each other. Far too many of us continue to hate each other because some of us are white, bright, most of white, some of us are brown. It's okay to stick around. Some of us are many shades of black and they tell you to get on the back. We must not separate ourselves based on our educational attainment. Our love for each other should transcend political educational, social, and religious boundaries. It should not matter if you have a BA, MA, PhD, EDD, MD, law degree, or no degree. Or you didn't even recognize your name when you saw it. Everybody is in the same boat. No man or woman is superior to another, man or woman. For we are all God's children. Amen. And there is a, at least one constant in our lives. We call that constant change. It's inevitable. Change will come. So I take this time out to go back to 1964 and say what Sam Cooke said about that. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know. Change gonna come. Oh, yes, you will. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's 
بسم الله Thank you. <laughs> 